here we are, leaving church. Continue so, point four miles. I can't and remember. Turn left on Huntington Turnpike. I can't remember having been to this church before. I don't know if I'm going to go again, but I hope I do because it was very, Continue very beautiful miles. inside. Then turn left on Huntington Turnpike. You walk in, and there's like this beige wall with a depiction of the Holy Spirit and um, the statues and and pillars. And normally beige is absolutely not my favorite color. Point one mile. So it's quite turn left rare on and turn that I walk into and a building right. and just see a bunch of beige and be like, oh my gosh, that's so beautiful. But it was. It was really beautiful. And the ceiling was turn like left wooded on and, and turn medieval. Right. And turn right. It was very, very beautiful. Um, presence of the Lord. Definitely in church. Absolutely, definitely in church. Um... The, the presence of the Lord makes itself in known one to mile. you Turn right in a variety of ways, or the, um, you know, the, the, the fear of the divine, the angels, you know, the church is always full of angels, and special angels come out during the Mass. Turn right on to Connecticut 15 South. You know, this is something that they always said, but you, you go through certain times in your life, and then you start really feeling the way that the divine is speaking to you. And it, it's kind of hard to describe it in a way that if you haven't experienced it, that you would find it to be sort of believable or know what I'm talking about because Everything that I can tell you that makes me feel personally addressed by the divine is something a person could say, oh, well, that's a coincidence, or wishful thinking, or you're kind of telling yourself a narrative, and, and, you know, and certainly all those happen in human psyche. You have wishful thinking. You have your own personal narrative that you're talking in your mind at any, you know, given time, unless you really do spiritual work to sort of fill that at times. And yet, and with that, you, you feel yourself in conversation with the divine. And, um, it's quite, I, I think it's like humbling and exalting at the same time, and it's something that can right, fill you nine miles on Maris Parkway. with a great joy, you know, and then, you know, if, uh, until you experience something that could be seen as, like, ominous or negative, and then it's something that could fill you with fear, but it's, it's not Jesus that fills you with fear. Jesus is love. Jesus mercy, Jesus is accepted, and in all my life, when I've seen, you know, good things and bad things, Jesus is always what I hold in my heart, is just Jesus, and so you have in church you know, and I, I never really realized the amazingness of just being able to go to church every day. It never felt necessary to me. You know, I was a parent. I was bringing kids to and from school. I was going to activities. I was trying to, you know, maintain my own social life and 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 just, just spiritual life and work and support the family and do lots of chores and, and all the things going on. I, I always found you know, once a week on Sundays, or like, sometimes other community church events were, you know, nice to go to, but really when things got bad in my life, church became meaningful to me and important in a whole, a whole new way. Um, and, you know, during the course of my child custody case, there have been, and I, I talk about this ad nauseum, but I talk about it because it's on my mind a lot, and it's important to me, and, you know, I feel like 
if I had known such things could happen, I would have conducted my life so much different, differently for so long in so many ways. So I, I do try to let people know that, hey, this is what happened to me, and what happens to one person could happen to another, and, you know, you know, and people can look at that and be like, oh, I wouldn't make some of the screwed up decisions you did. Well, maybe you'd make totally different screwed up decisions, or sometimes something screwed up can happen to you even if you make all the right decisions. And I think that's what's the most terrifying in life is, you know, you can sort of just not have a plan and drift through life, and then sometimes everything comes up your way, and wonderful things happen. Or even if you have a plan and make responsible decisions on your life, sometimes just bad things happen. And it's, you know, it's, again, it's terrifying and yet fills you with hope as well. Because even though at any point things could go horribly wrong, at any point things go wonderfully well for you and for everyone you love and everyone and and that's just a wonderful message of hope. So um you know so I went into church, I prayed my praise, um part of the church that I never really realized how special it was is there's a part during the mass is when you give everyone a sign of peace and everyone used to shake each other's hand. And it's like, we don't do that anymore. You know, they skip that all together, or people do it just among their close family, or, you know, people just kind of wave or flash peace signs, or, you know, and it's it's still, you know, sharing a gesture of, of goodwill and commonality among the community, but also that, that just actual direct contact. It's a, like, you ever go to the gas station now and, like we've been in the middle of this pandemic and sometimes you know not often but every now and again the cashier is not wearing a glove and they'll put you know your change in your hand and you know their hand will kind of touch your hand and you're like wow like you feel like a rebel you're like wow I can't remember the last time I had direct contact with someone that wasn't in my immediate family you know and um, it's it's just the things you don't really think about how meaningful and how much value they can have that are just simple things taken for granted until all of a sudden like everything gets turned upside down and you just see everything in a whole new way and that that was something that had happened to me personally with my years and years in the child custody court and my incarceration for um there was like lawyer fees I was supposed to pay in a certain way and I guess I didn't have the right understanding even though I had sent an email to all the parties involved saying well this is my understanding of how it's supposed to be paid. I got into court and it was supposed to be something different than I had thought and before I even was informed or had a chance to rectify it, boom, I found myself in jail. And you know, the priest came to visit me in jail and I it was just such a relief that, that someone talked to me I knew where I was something is happening um, you don't think about it when you're in jail the, the, the telephones are not the same um, you have to call collect and the person that you call is just informed that there's a collect call from a prison and it's, it's there's, a, there's a lot of clicks and silences and basically a lot of room for the person on the other end to be like this is the wrong number or crank call or spam or something like they don't tell you the name of the person that's in jail until you're talking to them and you're agreeing to pay for the call and all I can think of is I wonder how many people just sort of disappear without anyone kind of noticing where they've gone it's it's kind of frightening um, actually and I felt like I was sort of hanging on to a life raft and you know the priest was one of the life rafts that I, I hung on to and it was um it was a quite terrible experience, but also I learned a lot, and it, it, it was just eye-opening. Uh, it was a transformative experience in a, a lot of ways. Um, so, uh, I forgot what I was even talking about. <laughs> thinking about jail. Oh my gosh. Jail. And but one of the things I hadn't expected to go to jail. Like I had a I had a coffee in the car that I wanted to finish drinking after court. Like 
It was supposed to be a status conference. I wasn't supposed to be at risk of being incarcerated from what I understood beforehand. I had evidence that I had brought with me that I had felt like I was going to get some headway and some justice in the case and instead I was just shackled up and it was quite jarring, surprising, like I, I can't express enough my surprise and disturbance and like I don't even know what happened, like I guess my lawyer had the evidence, like I, I expected to come out of court number one at all, and number two, with more time with my kids, um, because of things that my kid's father was doing, which my understanding of how our child custody agreement was, he wasn't supposed to be doing, but to my surprise, I was just hit with things that apparently I was doing that I wasn't supposed to be doing, but I wasn't informed of them, and I was just incarcerated. Um, and they were financial things for the payments of where. Uh, it's, so that's partly why, you know, I'm not with my kids tonight, is just court was so distressing, I, and that time that I had believed that I was having the upper hand and then that just happened to me, it makes me just never kind of want to set foot in a courtroom, regardless of what of anything, I mean, it's, it's a whole new idea of the justice system, and the idea that I had beforehand was that I was going to get justice, and the idea that I came away with was that the justice system is an illusion, and that it's something that, whether you're right or you're wrong, you're lucky if you walk away from it unscathed. Like, that's... That's the impression that I have of the justice system now. And, um... So, what, what I was in court... Um... Yeah, this, this, this thing happened to me. I was going to say something about <laughs> religion and, and how... Oh, that's what it was. Okay, so it was... I found myself quite unexpectedly in a prison cell. And they said that they wanted some outrageous amount of money, which I didn't have. I, I didn't ha have any idea if I had any way of getting it. And in fact, they don't give you access to your bank cards or to phones and, you know, sort of things that you would have to do to, to get money, even if you had it. And it, I was basically wondering if anyone would notice and, and get me out of there, or if I was just in there, if like that was just it, that was all that I had of free life. And I was suddenly in, in like a cinder block room, and I had always thought that the child custody case would have an amicable resolution, that once the resolution came, my kid's father and I, this is what everyone had said, sort of the lawyers, everyone involved, that, oh, it's such a hostile situation now because your adversary is in court, and once it's wrapped up, you can be friends again and, and sort of develop this working co-parenting relationship or friendship or, you know, what, what one of the lawyers involved was like, oh, most of the people who, who start going through this process end up getting back together. Well, you know, they might be freaking scared. <laughs> they might be scared. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe they realized that however unhappy they were in their relationship, there was something turn to be left scared on, of. Left and then turn left. Um, and trying to separate it. You know, united front in the face of a common enemy and all that. I'm just getting off the highway because the car is making all kinds of noises and I think maybe some gas might help. And someone's flashing their lights that they want me to go faster even 5. though... 5.4 miles. Then turn left I'm on going 32 lane. in a 35 lane, which is sort of unheard of. 
because everyone wants to go at least five miles an hour over the speed limit. What is wrong with you people? Like, why? What is going on that everyone is in such a hurry to get to? Like, I don't understand why everyone has to go so fast all the time. I like to go slow. I like to see the sights. It's going one mile. Um, Turn left on so sometimes you kind of have to get somewhere as fast as possible, but those like should be few and far between. Like, why not give yourself lots of time? Turn left on Daybreak Lake. Like, I don't, I don't know. It's like everyone seems in such a hurry, going nowhere, just back and forth, just spinning their wheels. Um. So anyway, um, we're gonna go back to the main road. Turn left on North Campo Road. Then turn left. Get some left. Uh, Oh, I wanted bread or something. Oh, why do, why do they want to turn go? left on Cross Highway? Are they trying to put me back on the highway? Like, what? Well, at least we're off that main road where everyone wanted us to go really fast. And we can look. Drive point three miles, then turn left on Weston Road. Do you know how often I had to make turns where, you know, gas is at a premium. And yet, you often have to make a turn just because there's a car behind you and you don't want them to be like... I think if I just go straight... Turn left on Cross Highway. It's not that way, it's dead end. I think it's trying to send me back to the highway. Um, so anyway, um... I was in the, the four walls of the prison cell. I didn't know if I was going out. I, ho I hope that someone would notice and want me back enough to have my back to, to figure out how to get whatever amount of money or maybe, I know my mom was writing letters to like, you know, professional advocates and people who got people out of jail, like either someone would see the injustice and get me out or someone would want me back enough to just come up with the money. Then turn right on um, Avenue. Turn right on Avenue. hope, but you also have to face the fact that no, maybe that's it. Maybe you're just gonna be in there, and that's all that you have. Five point two miles. And then it's like turn right on I had expected to get a working friendship or a relationship or something with my kid's father, and if not, to sort of just go on and meet someone else, and then you know have a turn right on personal relationship, you know, romantic partnership, whatever you want to call it, to, to have love and to raise my children and to just, you know, find my path in life, find and rewarding work. And I wanted to do good in my life and it, now it just feels like, it feels like I had started out with such great, I mean, I was, I was working for charitable organizations and I had such hope to do good in my life, but then it feels like all I did is have this relationship with a person that didn't work out. And because it didn't work out, because it didn't work out, like all the stress and horrible right things on post happened to my family. And so in seeking to do good, I, I just did harm instead. And it's just so Turn right frightening on post to think that you had hoped to do good in your life, but you did harm instead and you have so few opportunities to do good, and it's like one of the things that you can do when you're like, oh, did I do enough good in my life? Is to just go to church and put a donation in the, in the donation box in church. Like, however much or little you have, if you're poor, you can collect cans and come up with like, you know, a dollar or something. Or if you have higher means, you can donate more. And the church, they, they do programs to help people. They, they have Catholic charities. They, they, they do direct services to help people get food and shelter and medical attention. So, so if you wanted to make a difference in the world and you think, you know, have I, have I not done enough? You can go to church and put whatever you know, whatever you can comfortably give in the box, and then you've and done something, something for someone. Right you've done at least a little bit of good in your day, 
And if you go through your day, you don't know if your life has meaning to anyone else. You know, and if you're a parent, you never have to have that worry because you are making a difference in the life of your child. Every little bit of you know, Turn right on love and attention help. you give your child, it's, it's worthwhile in itself. And also, it goes on. Your child can then give love and attention to other people. And, and that's greatly rewarding. But, you know, if you don't have kids or you're in a sort of a state of repressed parenthood like I am, you can put a little donation in the box of it. You've done so good in your day. Turn right on Muswell Road. And I mean, there's opportunities to do good everywhere. You know, God help us, we don't always see them, recognize them, or make as full use of them as we can. You know, sometimes it's hard to see them. It's challenging. Them, but you can't. But then turn you know, that's on something concert. that you can do, and you can do it every day. You can go to church every day. You can do it every day. Um, so, so yeah, that's my uh, my little bit of putting meaning in my life. And ho hopefully, it's not the only good bit of good I've done today. But if it is, you know, I've, I've done something good in the eyes of the Lord.